Hello and welcome to From No Crypto to No Crypto. This is the Crypto Coach, Blockchain Wayne, with another cryptocurrency podcast. Today's episode brought to us by Coincierge Club, mobile private key wallet and point of sale solution, helping to make crypto safe, easy, and overall process more efficient while costing less. Today we've got a special clip from the Cryptocurrent Conference that was held in New Orleans in March 2019. Now I want to thank Richard Carthon with Cryptocurrent for providing the audio from the event. Uh, myself, Ricky Bennett, uh, of CEO of The Rich Way, and Richard Carthon, CEO of Cryptocurrent, discuss, e- discuss education in crypto. So sit back, relax, and hope you enjoy this clip. About educating yourself and putting yourself in a, in a place where you can educate others, you know. And so what Richard is doing right now, to me, this is the beginning of something really special where people can get the proper education to make sound decisions in their lives financially as you move forward. So the first question here is, uh, uh, why do you focus on education around cryptocurrency and blockchain? So uh, first, thank you for uh, that intro and, and for, for bringing the importance of why we're here today, right? The educational piece. I focus on the educational piece because for, for widespread and, and mass adoption to happen, people need to understand what we're building. People need to understand why this is an opportunity. A lot of people, when you try to explain Bitcoin for the first time, blockchain for the first time, they're like, oh, I've heard of that thing, it died last year, kind of like he said. Or, um, I don't understand it, so I, I just leave it alone. Um, the same way when people call the internet a fad, the same way when, uh, as these newer technologies come into place, people want to throw it, throw it, disregard it simply because they don't understand it. And so the only way that you truly can understand something is by doing your research, doing your homework, and being able to have a deeper knowledge, not only for yourself, but when you're able to explain it to somebody else, you got it, right? It's just like uh, anything in life that you've ever tried to teach someone, you really can't teach until, uh, you, you, uh, you really can't understand it until you can teach someone else. And so after I had a conversation with someone over a year ago, and they're like, hey, what do you know about cryptocurrency and blockchain? And I was like, nothing. And I started doing research, and I started looking into it, and I saw all the crazy and amazing things that were being built in the space, I was like, man, why did it take so long for me to know about this? Why didn't I know about this back in 2008? Why didn't I hear about, like, why, why did it wait till 2017 for me to learn about this? I should have known about this four years ago. It's because no one was talking about it. So the first thing is you don't know what you don't know, so you need someone to at least tell you about a new concept to then understand that it's available. And then past that, once you know that it's there, it's your job to then learn some more and, and dig deeper into it so that you can then explore whether or not it's an opportunity for you. So once I discovered that cryptocurrency and blockchain was something I was interested in and could be beneficial for my life, I was like, how can I then bring that back to other people that I affiliate with every day? And uh, so this goes to uh, take us to our next question here. And uh, uh, most people only know about crypto because market price movements. What do you think people should learn when it comes to cryptocurrency and blockchain? I'll take that one. Um... Uh, you know, it's, and I get it, it all the time, just like what you talked about. People said they heard about it and they thought it crashed, right? This is more than just market price. I mean, a lot of us in this room, our goal is not for crypto to be worth a lot one day. It's for us to be able to utilize it the way it's meant to be used. I don't need to cash it out to U.S. dollars or whatever. So, but it's more than just finance as well. Like blockchain, I had this conversation with someone yesterday. Blockchain is going to revolutionize so many different technologies, so many different industries, should I say because it's just, it's better, right? I mean, how many people here have a beeper? Anybody? No? No doctors in the room, right? Do they still work? If they were out there, they would still work, right? For what they were designed for, but there's better technology. So there's better technology coming, and that's really what happens, and we're in this life cycle where technology gets implemented, and it's, like Richard said, it's it's called a fad at first. It's ridiculed before it's adopted by the masses. Uh, when you think about, if you remember when the first iPhone came out, I remember, and I'm a tech guy, I looked at it and I said, well, that's really silly. Who's gonna use their phone for stuff like that? And what, you know, what do we have today? So they really need to understand just how many different things this can revolutionize. We, we heard the talk earlier about NFTs, you know, just non-fungible tokens, just being able to be used to buy digital land or to, uh, to buy collectibles, you know, back to, People that are reminiscent, I used to collect baseball cards, and now they're able to collect a digital card that has, has some, some unique use case. It's limited. 
it's just a better system. And, and then you've got to also understand how the current system works, right? Why things are the way they are. And, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency are going to just revolutionize so many things that people need to get past what it's worth, what I can buy it for and sell it for, and really focus on how can this technology change the world. Anything from whether it's, you know, when you buy a house, right? We've got some people in the room in the real estate industry. How many different people do you have to pay just to make that sale happen, right? You've got to pay the closing attorney. You've got to pay the title search, you know, the title company. I mean, all those different things that can be solved by a blockchain, you don't need those middlemen. Just like you don't need, um, you don't need to go check in at a, at a front desk uh, to stay in a hotel when you can just book it, you book it on your, on, you know, book it on your phone on Airbnb and show up at the place where you're supposed to stay. You don't need that, that third party involved just to uh, basically do what they got to do. So that, I, I reference a lot of other technologies when I talk about crypto and blockchain, just so people really understand that. Um, this, every technology has a life cycle, right? The, the Wright brothers, a long time ago, were ridiculed. They, they were thought to be mad and crazy for wanting to fly. And, you know, there's some people here that came here on an airplane. That's how things evolve, right? So when people, you know, Henry Ford even said it best, you know, people don't even realize what's possible until you show them. And if he would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said they wanted faster horses, right? But instead, he created a technology different than that. And this is the vehicle that's going to really revolutionize, yeah, the finance industry, the investment industry, but also real estate, um, trade. I mean, there's so many different things that are going to come from that. And you just want to spend some time every day finding resources and, and learning about what's going on. Not the news that's, you know, the mainstream news is telling you, you know, Bitcoin is crashing or crypto is crashing or, or you know, or that that whole block you know blockchain's good but crypto's not i mean it's all it's all one ecosystem uh and find those resources that can show you what's possible and and that's really you know that's really where we need to go with that not so much worrying about too much about what's it worth today all right well um i'll lead to my next question here um i actually i drove here five hours here from houston to get here and this is my first time ever been exposed to this type of environment with crypto so my next question here is what can people do and where can people go to learn more about cryptocurrency? Um, so there's a lot of great resources that are out there. Um, there's a lot of great uh, content marketers that are um, creating all kinds of uh, great information. So uh, one reliable way, if you want to see any kind of cryptocurrencies that out there, you look at one called CoinMarketCap. Um, CoinMarketCap.com, you go on there, you can see all the listings of all the different cryptocurrencies that are out there. You can find more information on uh, their projects, their teams, what their... Uh, trade market volume is, and, and everything that you possibly want to know about that. Um, also, there's a lot of different um, you know, podcasts that you can look, look at. So, of course, you can go check out Cryptocurrent. You can go check out um, From No Crypto to No Crypto. Um, if you need to see some informational videos, uh, not to steal too much thunder from a later speaker, you can go check out Rachel Siegel's uh, YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel. She has very phenomenal content that she puts out there to really uh, bridge the gap for people who are trying to learn about what's happening in the space. Um, but also you should go join communities. There's a bunch of huge Facebook communities that you can go out there. One of the biggest ones that I'm going to caveat right now is CCT. Um, Joe Blackburn, with um, he is uh, the founder of it, and he's going to be speaking later uh, at, at, our, at our last uh, panel discussion of the day. But that is a massive community where people are constantly going and engaging and presenting questions, and then people instantly answer you. Um, it's, it's a very inviting environment. People in this space want to learn with you. People want to push the envelope. And the, you know, going back to the, there's no such thing as a stupid question, there's not when you're trying to learn to be able to push the conversation forward. And we are very much in a time right now where you have access to as much information um, as you want in this space. You just have to just take that little initiative to like go look for it and then join communities that can help you um, answer questions that you might not even be able to find on the internet. So we'll add to that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, just to add to that, a couple things. Um, yeah, I'm partial to CoinCheckup.com. I mean, Coin Market Cap, Coin Checkup. Not just because it get you know when you go in, the first thing you're going to see is price, but when you dig deeper, it gives you a lot of information about the project, links to the project, links to the white paper, to learn more. Because when you're looking at cryptocurrency, it's not just hey, what can I buy that's going to go up, but what technology is out there that's going to really solve a real world problem. And so you can look at what that project does. You can see where it goes. So uh, either one of those. I mean, those are great free resources you can utilize. 
Uh, but on, on top of that, on top of the Facebook communities, um, you know, there's a lot of presence uh, on Twitter for crypto, but also there's meetup groups, right? There, if you download the meetup app and, and or go, just go to Facebook events or meetup app, you can find there's groups all around that are meeting just to discuss crypto. And that's kind of, that's how Richard and I connected, right? It was, we, we didn't go to the same meetup group. We actually went to a meetup group that Jason, one of the guys in the audience went to. And they told him, because I had met Jason at, at another meetup, him and, him and his girlfriend, Raina, and, and they basically told us we should connect. Share my number, Richard, call me. Because this space, it's, like, he's right, there, there's so many, there's, there's, the barriers to get in are kind of hard for people to understand right now, just because it's not, it's not just easy. There's no, like, one, two, three, this is it. But that's what we're working on changing. And so we've got, you know, we've got to work together. And just, just from, from the competition space, he has a podcast. I have a podcast. I promote his podcast, too, because any resource that's out there to teach people, we need to all be behind. There's no room. There's no room in this space for competition right now. We've all got to come together and learn. And you can do that when you go to a crypto meetup. You may be able to teach something to somebody new, or you may be able to learn something from somebody else. It's, it's that economy. It's no different than if you're familiar with uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, the mastermind concept. That's a powerful concept. You know, you can, you can do a lot of great things by yourself, but when you come together in groups, that's when the magic happens. question is someone like me you know i have no experience whatsoever but at the, at the same time i'm very intrigued i'm like i want to invest i want to get started right now like what advice would you give to someone like me how do we get in the game you know how do we start investing in the market and things like that so all right so i just got way loud huh? so the biggest thing about that is is you want to understand what you're investing in and we had this conversation with the group we um, do an online class on Thursdays, Richard and myself um, kind of tag team. Um, you really want to understand what you're getting into. Now, there's nothing wrong. I'll be honest. My first transaction, I didn't even know what Bitcoin was. My buddy said we should buy Bitcoin. I looked at the process to get it on Coinbase or anywhere else, and it was kind of lengthy. So I, I took my cash, and I went to a crypto ATM and bought a few Bitcoin from it at the time. kind of sounds crazy now. It was actually probably about 10 miles from here. I was sitting in a gas station putting hundred dollar bills into a machine while my friend that rode over there with me was buying fried chicken, you know, but that was, you know, I didn't understand what I was getting into. But then after that, I said, okay, if I'm going to really hold this long time, I need to understand what I've gotten into. What do, what do I have? And you just go down the rabbit hole. So there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, I don't even understand Bitcoin, but I bought some, or I don't even understand Ethereum or Litecoin or any of them, but the, educate yourself on what you're getting into because um, you know, it, it's, it's just you want to understand that project. You want to look into, do they have a use case? That's why you go to CoinMarketCap or CoinCheckup and you can link back to the, that development team's page most of the time and you can see what's being done. You can see their white paper. What is the use case? And then look and ask yourself, does this really solve a real world problem or did they just put this thing on the blockchain, created a cryptocurrency because it was the fad, right? There's thousands of cryptocurrencies out there right now, but there's only a handful of them that are going to really do some great things. Some of those may not even been invented yet, which is why you want to constantly educate yourself because as the technology evolves, you know, it's going to be very speculative at first, but in the long term, it can solve a lot of real world problems. So you just really want to dig in there and get into those communities and try to see what you can learn from what they have. A lot of, a lot of projects, they'll have um, you know, it's really kind of the best we have right now, but the Telegram app has, some of the development teams have a Telegram app where their development team is accessible to where you can ask questions. Um, and there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of junk in Telegram too, but you, that's kind of where our resources are right now. You've got to siphon through that to figure out what's good. But at the end of the day, it's really just education, right? You, you know, we can, you know, we can, step by step, you want to learn how to do it, we can talk to you offline if you, if you have any questions. How do I, questions I get the most, how do I buy this, how do I buy that? You know, then that's really the, the biggest question right now, other than what is it, but educate yourself. You know, you just get entrenched into what this technology can do, how, you know, what it can solve. So, anything you wanna add? Yeah, just to, to get in the game right now, the fastest way to do it is Coinbase, just being straight up with you. Um, but kind of going to uh, Wayne's point of, this is so early, to get through a lot of this right now, you might need someone to hold your hand to like do everything to make sure you don't mess it up the first time, and that's okay. Because then after you have done that and you get to the point to where you feel very confident about what you've been able to 
uh, do, whether it's buy your first cryptocurrency or buy your first altcoin on a different exchange that doesn't have it, that if, if you're not dealing with Coinbase, you have to go, uh, let's call it to um, Binance to buy some of these altcoins that you're interested in um, and figuring out like how do you set up your uh, Ether address or make sure you're sending it to the right place. And it, it is a strenuous process and that's why the barrier to entry is high right now. But after you do it and you see, oh, this can be done, it's not that bad. Um, it, it just speeds up the whole process. And then now when you get a friend, you can help them out and now it just, it, it's a wave, it's ripple effects. But just starting, right? Just doing that first initial, uh, buying that, y y your first you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is, your first investment, then like now you're, you're in the game. So like now you wanna pay attention to what's going on in the market. Then you also wanna pay attention to where are some other projects going in. Um, once you are in it, it, you're, you're going to want to stay up to date on everything that's, that's occurring in it. And I got one more thing to add to that because it's more, it's not just about knowing where to buy it and everything else, but, and I see this a lot because you've got out there, there are some people that are just crypto extremists. And one of the benefits of crypto is you're responsible for your own security. You, you typically can hold your own private keys. You are in essence, your own bank, your own security. That can be good and bad, right? There's some people we know that probably aren't ready to be, you know, to hold their own private keys. So, and I see this a lot in, in a lot of different chats and groups where someone will say something about Coinbase and, you know, some hardcore extremists will be like, Coinbase is bad, you don't hold your own private keys. And yeah, to an, to an extent, that is true. I mean, we've seen just recently where an exchange up in Canada where the, the you know, the owner of that exchange or CEO, whatever you want to call them, died and, and or supposedly died. I mean, I don't know, it's still questionable, but died and now no one supposedly could access the private keys. Now that ended up it being empty anyway, but that's a real thing that can happen when you don't hold the private keys that company does. They own it, right? You don't own it. You just have, you know, hopefully you can get it out before then, but there's different levels of entry for people. So if someone says, hey, I, I've downloaded Coinbase, the Coinbase app, set up an account and I bought some Bitcoin, you know, some people will be like, you don't need to have it on Coinbase. That's not good. You need to move it here. We need to celebrate that because that's a, that's a step in and there's barriers to entry. Now, if you're telling me you're holding $10,000 on Coinbase, worth of crypto on Coinbase, I'm going to tell you, you probably need to move it, right? Because there's different levels of security, right? Now, I compare it, I hate to do it like this, but it's where people can understand to cash. If I had a $10 bill, I'd put it in my front pocket. I'm not really worried about losing it, you know? I can put it there and that, that's saying you've got, you know, 10, 20, 30, maybe a few hundred dollars of crypto into, in, on an exchange's wallet. Now, now I've got $1,000 on me, maybe I'm gonna put that in, in my wallet, you know, my physical wallet in my back pocket, protect it a little more. That's when you go into maybe some hot wallets, like mobile wallets where you hold the private keys, but it's on your phone. And if you've got a large stash, you've got a wad of hundreds, you know, or thousands, you know, you're not gonna keep that in your wallet on you. You're gonna keep that in the vault at home, and that's your cold storage wallet. So there's different levels of entry and different levels of wallets and security that you can take but I said all that just to say, don't ever knock someone for holding crypto in a certain place, right? Teach them, educate them. You always want them to learn, but there's different, different levels that people are comfortable getting into right now. And I've actually been coached through a little bit of that right now too. So that brings me to my next question. Um, it seems to be very few places to spend cryptocurrencies. And obviously, um, after investing in it and things like that, what can we all do, different knowledge, knowledge levels, what can we all do to speed up the process so that it is more spaces to actually spend cryptocurrency? What can we do as a group? Yeah, so one of the first ways that you can do it is as you start going to some of these different establishments that you go to, how many of you get coffee on a regular basis? Yeah? So every time that you go to a coffee shop, if you just ask, hey, do you accept Bitcoin? Hey, do you accept cryptocurrency, right? The first question, or the first response probably would be no. But eventually their boss or their manager is gonna be like, wow, this is money we're missing or, or missing out on. How do we find a way to accept this, right? So now as you're like pushing that envelope to places that you're going to all the time, where it's a sandwich shop, whether it's um, just, just a place that you religiously visit and you just ask the simple question, hey, do you accept this? Eventually, it's, if they hear it enough times, they're gonna be like, wow, we are missing a market. We gotta jump on this. So that is, that's just one way that you're planting a seed in people's minds of, hey, we need to start looking to um, accepting these types of payments. Um, another way, if you're just looking at, at different like uh, use cases of, of people that accept um, cryptocurrencies, I mean, Overstop.com accepts it right now. Um, there's a couple of uh, traveling agencies, I believe Expedia has accepted Bitcoin. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they still do, but uh, there, there are a lot of ways right now where you can go and, and, and spend different cryptocurrencies and they accept. However, to keep it growing, uh, first, people have to know that it's a, it's a, you have to have it, right? First, you have to have it to be able to spend it. And then once you have it, um, what are you doing to then engage with different uh, companies to want them to accept it? Um, so that's just one of, one of the few ways that I, I can think of off top. So I'll tell you a little story. So um, there's a financial breakthrough seminar in Houston next week. And I was going to get my ticket for it. And the CEO of that company is sitting right here, the rich way. He's having a financial breakthrough seminar. So I told him, man, I'd like to pay for that seminar with Bitcoin. I just wanted to be the first one to do it, you know, for his company. But I walked him through the process of setting up the wallet. And we went through it. And it actually, when he saw it, it saved both of us money. Because I didn't have to pay that $11 to Eventbrite for, for that fee. And he doesn't have a cut from Eventbrite taken out. Uh, now, now we kind of went around it as far as I sent him Bitcoin, right? And then he sent me a code that would knock the price of the seminar down from 150 to zero, right? And so we, we eliminated it. So just showing people that, that entry. And, and also when I talk to people and I teach them something about crypto for the first time, like maybe they're completely new, um, we can know a lot, right? We all went to school and we learned in school, but it's not until we get into the world and we actually do that really makes it makes it makes it stick, right? You, you, can, you can read a book on how to, you know, how to overhaul an engine, but until you actually do it, 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 it's not real. So what I like to do is I'll have people download a wallet and I'm gonna send you some crypto. Download this wallet, download that wallet. Now they've gotta learn how to download the wallet. They've gotta write down their, you know, their private seed. And then they've got to be able to pick the right address to send to me. And I tell you, when I, when I do it in person, it's a lot easier, but sometimes when it's over message chat, it, it, it's actually, I'll get like three different addresses before I'm like, okay, finally you sent me the right address to send to you, right? So it's just that process to make it easier, not just saying, yeah, I read about, I heard about, you know, crypto or Bitcoin or whatever, but I actually, you know, I have some, I have a wallet, I downloaded it and somebody sent it to me. And we can all do that in that space. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot, you know, just to send people. I don't, I don't send them a lot of crypto, but I'll send them a few dollars worth just that way they, they can say, I have some, I know what it is. And it also sparks that interest that when you hold it, you're like, I want to know more about it. What do I really have? And so that, that's just kind of that cycle we have to keep going. You know, I mean, I, I was told somebody yesterday, the more we ask a place, a business, if they accept crypto, is gonna, it's going to stick more because you're going to have somebody that, you know, there's platforms being developed right now and already rolling out to where, you know, they can accept crypto, like whether it's point of sale in, in, the, in a physical location or online, but when those platforms are, are looking for clients to sign up for their crypto, plat, you know, crypto acceptance, uh, they're going to go to that business owner. A business owner is going to say, well, nobody ever asked me if they can pay with Bitcoin. So then there's no need, right? And, and the problem is nobody's asking. And that's where we got to get, that's where we got to get to. All right, that's good. And this next question, you sort of covered some things. So I know, uh, Richard, you may be able to touch on this as well. Uh, speaking to a new person, um, when you have so many systems out there right now, why is cryptocurrency and blockchain necessary? Speaking to a new person, what would you say? So the biggest reason why I believe it's necessary is getting away from centralization and just the whole premise of, you know, why was cryptocurrency made in the first place, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, Sterling touched on it today, but uh, you know, a quick, another quick lesson. You know, 2008, you had the, the giant recession that basically impacted the entire world. Um, so you had the, the Sayo Sinaminis, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto come and create Bitcoin. Um, and from Bitcoin, then uh, you have decentralized money that is um, both the, it's de decentralized, finite. Um, it is Sayo Sinaminis, which, you know, you can be kind of anonymous when you do it. Um, it is... The visible, it goes all the way down to a Satoshi, which is one hundredth of a millionth decimal point. And then um, you also can, uh, uh, because of the supply of it, it, it's very easily transferable, which makes it immutable. With, with being on the blockchain, it's immutable. So after a person can first understand, like, what is cryptocurrency in the, in the first place, now, like, their mind opens up to, okay, I can see why that's practical. I can see why I could start using this in other places. So... Uh, the, the biggest reason is that as you have more responsibility for your money and you can cut down on the cost of all the money that you already spend in a lot of different ways, whether you're talking about your taxes, whether you're talking about every time that you transfer money internally through your accounts, any time that you were trying to like uh, get your accounting right, there's 
um, your, your tax write-offs with your, with your benefits, with everything with that. There are a lot of ways as blockchain starts to develop even more. There's a, there's a local company called Gilded uh, that is basically trying to uh, attack this. And um, there's just so many use cases of how our everyday lives are going to be enhanced um, using utilizing this technology. And it's all about just being able to see like it's in the pipeline, it's in the works. People are putting in the effort to make this happen. We just don't even know it's there. Um, so first you want to spark someone's curiosity and just be like, okay, this is something I need to pay attention to. Now, now that I have your curiosity, here's how I sink my teeth into you and make sure that you want to go down the rabbit hole and learn even more. Question here is, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, or many people, may say this, especially moving forward. A skeptical and individual may say, "This is just a fad. It's just a bubble." You know, what do you say to those type of people? Yes, yeah, so I think I, I kind of touched on that earlier. I mean, any any new technology is ridiculed before it's embraced by the masses, right? You've got your innovators, then you've got your early adopters, and then then the masses come in, and then you've got your laggards, right? The laggers are the people you see walking around that still have flip phones on their hip, right? So it, it's just, but there's, there's a tipping point that you've got to get to, um, you know, with that. So kind of like you mentioned, you know, I, I've got a picture saved in my phone. I send it to people all the time. It's a Newsweek magazine from 1995 that says the Internet is a fad. How has the Internet revolutionized everything? About what happened in early 2000s with the dot-com bubble burst, Right. You look, there was a lot of dot-com companies coming out. Every company was putting dot-com on their name just because it was the thing to do, right? And what happened? That bubble did burst, and a lot of those bad companies went away. But what emerged is the technology that we're using today. So a bubble bursting is not necessarily a bad thing. You need that to kind of spark a movement because what's happened since the quote-unquote crypto bubble burst at the end of 2017 is last year, as I was going to conferences in different areas, you talk to all these different companies that are, that are implementing amazing infrastructure that's coming. So that catalyst sparked a movement with a lot of companies out the, that, are, that are creating real products that solve real problems. And so that's where we're going with this, the same way, you know, the, you know, the, same way the Internet has, been, has revolutionized the world, the same way smartphone, smartphones revolutionized the communication industry. This is going to revolutionize the data and finance industry as, as well. So it, it, it's, if you look at history, it cycles. It, it's, it's no different, right? You know, when you know, that technology is ridiculed, and the next thing you know, everybody's using it. And just look at the, the items we have in our home. I mean, how many years ago do you think people probably laughed when they said, we're going to put this device in your kitchen that's going to use uh, radioactive waves to cook your food? You think a lot of people were scared of that? Right now, how many people here don't have a microwave in their home? Very few, right? Uh, I did without one for a little while, but my wife made us bring it back in, you know. But still, it, it's it's just that's that's the cycle of, of technology and just the cycle of life when you think about it. Um, I have we have one final question here, but I we do have a few minutes here, and uh, I'm really big on making sure that everyone uh, get their questions out. Sometimes you have individuals that you have things you want answered, and maybe we didn't ask the question here, so. Is there anyone here in the crowd that has a question that you would love answered? Just raise your hand if, if that's the case. If not, I'll ask the final question. We're good to go. Okay. All right. Can, can I do this here? Uh, can I do some oh, oh, you like? Okay, good. Yeah, okay, good. Go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when you're trying to discern, so as a new person, there's Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's Ripple. What's the new person? How do they discern which to where to start? Yeah, great question. So. I would say the best place to start is to go and look at what are they actually working on? What are they building? Uh, what is the, the, the project itself? So if you look at um, the Internet of Things, when the, the dot-coms came out, you had all these different websites for XYZ. You, you were trying to see different use cases. So when Google first came out and it was a search engine and people didn't understand, like, oh, I don't need a phone book anymore. I can go look this up. You're like, oh, that makes sense. I should put money in that, right? So there's a lot of different... Um, coins that are out that are considered cryptocurrencies that are coins, but they're not really a, like a, a currency per se. If you look at the Ethereum, Ethereum's a platform and a lot of things are being built on top of it. You have a lot of forks, uh, basically when, when something is being built on top of it or, or, or kind of going in a new direction, uh, where you have a lot of other cryptocurrencies that are then being built on top of, of, of that. 
And so the way that you would look into it, you would go to like some of these coin market caps or, or coin journal, what is it? Coin checkup. Coin ch checkup, where you go and, and do research on, uh, you, you go to their website and you see like, okay, what are they ultimately trying to solve? What, what is the purpose of this cryptocurrency? And then next you go look at, okay, um, how much money is being poured into this? How much money have they raised? Because just like the same way when you would look at an investment, um, if you're looking at a, a stock portfolio, you see like, okay, who's on the team? What is their, uh, how much money did they raise? Uh, where is it headed? What are their projections for the next whatever years? If you look at a lot of these new coins, they've only been around for a year, a couple years. Uh, to, to really look at like, if you think about the startup industry, and you think about, you know, you have a ton of companies that will go raise millions of dollars. 95% of them fail. And do you consider that a failure? No. But the five that make it, the five percent, huge returns. So the same way that you would do due diligence on a company, on, on the next Facebook, on the next whatever, you just go and find a project that sounds pretty cool and then go look them up and find out, okay, how much can I dig up to make sure that this is a sound investment? So like that's how I would approach it. And other than that, I mean, I usually tell people, and just keep this real sharp, but if you don't understand what's out there, buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been around um, since 2008, you know, 2009 when the Genesis block was created, right? So there, there's some history there. It's, it's been through, if, and if you look at the history, you want to understand the history of Bitcoin because that's where, I mean, every cryptocurrency that's come out since has been uh, a quote-unquote improvement, not necessarily, but that's their, their goal is to be an improvement or solve a problem that maybe Bitcoin may have to make it better, right? To make it more private, to make it uh, faster. Like everything's an improvement on that. So get that because the thing about that, I mean, right now we talk about cryptocurrencies and market cap and that's one thing I want to get away from eventually, but for right now, that's where we look at it. What's the value of the total supply? And Bitcoin is over 50% of the total supply, right? So if you buy Bitcoin, you can also, if you decide, you look into another project that's another altcoin that's maybe down the list in the market cap, but it looks promising, right? It, this, hey, this solves a real problem. I definitely want to be a part of this. Then you can acquire that with Bitcoin, right? So always, you know, you want to start there and don't get lost in, the, you know, it's kind of hard. There's thousands of them out there, right? So just start there and then, then you'll go down that rabbit hole and it's really just trying to educate yourself on what it is, um, what industry, you know, Tammy, you're in real estate, right? So you, you may want to look at some of the projects that could revolutionize the real estate industry. And add one more thing to that. The way I would look at uh, where Bitcoin is right now. So if everyone remembers AOL, they were the, one of the first movers and they were huge. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, they're the greatest thing ever. Is AOL still around? No. But they paved the way for a lot of these other companies to come in and be amazing. Um, that might be Bitcoin. It might not be Bitcoin. It might be one of these other altcoins that, you know, uh, one of these other altcoins might be a Google, might be an Amazon, might be whatever. But you don't know until you do the research to see like what are they actually working on. Uh, Wayne made an earlier statement of there's over, there's thousands of cryptocurrencies out there right now. There's only a couple hundred that actually have a working product. So first look at, okay, who actually has a product? Who's actually building a product and when should the roadmap it come out? And then how are they gonna actually use it? Because it's great to have these great ideas that's gonna revolutionize the world, but if no one uses it, what's the point? The difference between uh, cryptocurrency and hash graph. Yeah, so I think I know you, you probably watched the YouTube series, uh, The History of Money, right? Is that where you get that from? Well, I, I, it's what it sounds to me like it's similar a little bit, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked in the hash graph a whole lot. I mean, that, that was the first I heard of it. There's a YouTube series called The History of Money, which is great, but they kind of talk about hash graph being an improvement on blockchain, uh, but there's a lot of centralization in that. So Hashgraph may solve a problem in a centralized entity. Like if a, if a business wanted to run, you know, run some infrastructure within their organization, not necessarily where we, you, know, you would need a, a public blockchain, like a private blockchain just for their organization to use, then that technology may work. But there's a lot of centralization in the way that thing is built versus blockchain where it's a, it's a distributed ledger where you have you know, multiple different um, you know, computers or di different different things running that that create that blockchain, um, and that, that's kind of the best answer I can give because I haven't done a whole lot of research on Hashgraph. I mean, the first I've heard of it was whenever uh, I was watching that you know watching that series. But when they explain the technology in there, it just seems like there's a lot of centralization from it. I don't know if anybody else has looked into it at all. Yeah. 
All right. My generation has put on twenty-two trillion dollars for your own generation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, cryptocurrency eventually, in your mind, take over the dollar bill as currency. I'll, 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 I'll touch on that. I think yeah, that's, that's a very loaded question, and there's a lot of things that we get into it. The short answer is, I think it can in due time. So the biggest use case why I say why it can is because no inflation, that's the biggest thing. It's decentralized. That means no, one can, no central entity can go and mess it up ultimately, and it's international. If you look at right now, where in the world can you go where if you have a, like, you have a certain currency and you go anywhere else, you're always going to have to change to that currency. However, with cryptocurrency, if you have a Bitcoin, if I go to Japan, if I go to London, if I go anywhere in the world, I give you this Bitcoin, we all understand this is what it's worth. That's powerful. And this is just the beginning. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's a long road to that happening. There's a lot that, you know, we're, we're looking, we're seeing inflation happen every day in front of us. And it's not as extreme as Sterling talked about in, in Venezuela or, or like in Zimbabwe, but there are other countries where they, they've witnessed that. It, it's, it's, it's happening slowly in front of us because the U.S. dollar is exporting a lot of that debt to other countries. Because, I mean, let's face it, when you hear about us paying other countries, we're, we're probably just, we're printing the money to go out there, right? So inflation is happening, uh, but just like anything else, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's little by little every year. But there's going to be a tipping point where, you know, there's going to need something better. You know, the government's going to fight to keep the system running the way it is. And, you know, that's why I said if we got time, because if you can really go into how the Federal Reserve actually operates, I mean, that's probably the biggest Ponzi scheme of all time. And, you know, if anybody disagrees, I don't know. But that, that's kind of my personal opinion. And then you, you compound that with fractional reserve banking, pro, you know, pro, processes. And yeah, we're headed for a disaster. So something's going to happen, and a new technology is going to have to emerge that's going to take over that too. You know, just because that that's it's going to collapse. Well, we're a little we're wrapping up here. So this last question is important. Uh, number one, we thank you, you guys, for this information. But obviously, this is about progression and getting more information. How do all of us find you and follow you on to be able to follow what you do as we move forward? Absolutely. Uh, the short version is if you just Google search cryptocurrent, uh, you'll be able to find all this information, even with the conference. Uh, also, just network with me. Happy to get you any information that you need to further this conversation. Also, if you're in the space and would ever like to like, come and talk about other things, I'm always looking for people on my show to, to have conversations with. So I'd love to connect that way. And for me, I mean, if you search from no crypto to no crypto, from N-O to K-N-O-W, that's that's my platform that I use right now. Website's under construction, but I've got the Facebook page. I'm set up on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and I basically have a podcast that I do a few episodes a week. It's on all the platforms, iTunes, Google, um, Spotify, Stitcher. But and my whole focus is I know everyone's attention span these days is very small, right? So my podcast episodes are geared towards that 20-minute. You know, there's a lot of po great podcasts out there that are hour, hour and a half long. 20 minutes is, is kind of my, what I look for, and everything I talk about on there is centered around education and things that will move us towards adoption. So uh, just search for it there. And then uh, if you don't know anything about the space, I've got a basic beginner's guide on Amazon under the same name. Uh, it's only a few bucks. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever even touched the money that I made from the book sales last year, but it's, it's mainly just to educate people on the basics of where to get those resources, and I just kind of point people to other resources as far as to, to continue learning. Well, that was the, the final of, of our questions here. And uh, again, we're thankful uh, for this information. And again, like I said to everyone, what I'm excited about is just the process of just learning and being around individuals that uh, have some information I don't have. So uh, we're thankful for this. And this will pretty much wrap up our this session here. So. All right, that's it for today's episode. I want to thank you for listening in. And also I want to, again, thank Richard Carthon on CryptoCurrent for providing the audio. And also stay tuned for a special announcement coming up about the CryptoCurrent Conference 2020. Going to be held in New Orleans in 2020. Stay tuned, and we'll catch you on the next episode.